Much love to everyone that's uh, tuned in right now. Thank you uh, for taking the time to watch uh, this presentation. I really appreciate it. Uh, everybody in the live chat as well. If you came later, oh, thank you for taking the time. Um, I hope you guys are having a good day. Uh, before I begin this video, I wanted quickly uh, to mention something uh, or some things in reference to uh, this video. Uh, first, uh, throughout the video, you will see some uh, paintings of American Indians or indigenous people. These real paintings are from the walls of uh, palaces, castles, churches, government buildings, etc. Uh, from the 16th and 17th century in Germany. All right. Just want to remind everyone that I did three videos uh, showing a lot of these paintings and where you can actually find them. In case you haven't seen these videos, I recommend going ahead after this presentation and uh, going and seeing those videos, you know, like it's the first time, you know, it's they're from two years ago already, uh, but they're still very relevant. Again, it's uh, three parts of this video, you know, part one, two and three uh, allegory of the uh, continents, right? Uh, also, I wanted to mention that we will be uh, discussing who was really being used for diving uh, for pearls uh, today, you know, which were uh, American indigenous people who we're going to see, uh, who had the expertise since uh, ancient times, all right? They were the ones doing it since ancient times. Now, I didn't include uh, 
something I'm going to mention right now. But I have talked and shown that the first supposed slaves or so-called Negroes in Bermuda were actually brought from Venezuela uh, to dive for pearls. So, you know, we proved it was not actually Africans, uh, but American indigenous people they had brought. I will be doing, you know, another follow-up video on that uh, to prove it again. Uh, but I want to show you something real quick, just for an example. Now, again, if you Google, um, you know, Bermuda's first uh, slaves or, or, or anything like that, uh, you know, you're going to get something like this. It says in the 17th century, right? 1616, first non-Anglos arrived. In 1616, the first so-called black man and a Carib Indian, all right? Carib Indian and a so-called black man were brought to Bermuda on the ship Edwin to die for pearls. To die for pearls. We're going to see today, we're going to read from a book of the history of the pearl, right? A very scholarly book. And we're going to see who was really diving and who was the experts, who were the so-called Spanish or British or so-called Dutch. Remember, these are Sephardic Jews, mostly Moorish, uh, crypto Jews or crypto Muslims who are the captains of these ships who are all doing all this stuff, colonizing them. And, and, you know, and again, these are indentured servants. Now, let me show you another example. Uh, this is the first things I Googled and the first two links that came up. All right. So slavery in Bermuda, the first slaves were brought in Bermuda in the 1620s. Soon after the British colony was established in the island, the indenture, all right, indenture or debt bonded contract labor in Bermuda continued until 1684. All right. So it says the first blacks to come to Bermuda in real large numbers were free West Indians, free, free West Indians, not slaves who emigrated from territories taken from Spain. The slaves initially worked under seven years of bond, as did most English settlers, all right? You understand? Just like the English, they had a bond, they had an indenture, they had a contract, seven years. It wasn't slavery, like how they told us, Kunta Quinte, all the time. If anything, they asked, they were cruel people, but you got to prove to me. Each case was the, like that. You know, you got to prove to us. You know, a lot of these people just worked like this. They had seven years of bond. So they weren't just so-called slave and the English settlers had the same status. They were both doing the same thing. How come you're not calling them slaves? They were doing the same thing. This way to repay the administrators for the cost of their transport. All right. Again, they brought, you know, a so-called black man and a Carib Indian to die for pearls. We've actually going to see, you know, there's no history of any so-called uh, person that actually was born in Africa that ended up in venezuela that actually was brought to bermuda that's a whole lot of conjecture and black is a crayon color all right so let's dodge the hijack so let's hear the book of the pearl the history art science and industry of the queen of gems by george frederick Kuntz, phd charles hugh stevenson lmm whatever that means so new york this is written in 1908 all right the book of the pearl all right, so we're in chapter 10 of this book, and it says here, Pearl Fisheries of Venezuela. When I discovered the Indies, I said that they composed the richest country in the world. All right? When I discovered the Indies, the richest country in the world, I spake of gold and pearls and precious stones and the traffic that might be carried on in them. Extract from Columbus, fourth letter. The Caribbean Sea furnishes one of the most interesting chapters in the history of the pearl fisheries. In no region of the world have these resources caused more rapid exploitation or affected the inhabitants to a greater extent than on the shores of Venezuela. All right, we're talking about the same place where they went and got the so-called Indian and Negro, right? In 1616. All right, so it affected the inhabitants. Who's the inhabitants? We're talking about the aboriginals, the indigenous people of that place. Before the discovery of America, the natives, again, the natives, not Africans, of this region collected pearls. All right, the natives of this region collected pearls from the mollusks, which they opened for food in times of necessity, and also sought them for ornamental purposes. And although they had large collections which they used for personal ornamentation and for decorating their temples, it does not appear that they prized them extravagantly, readily bartering from them for small returns. 
In Columbus' account of his third and fourth voyages to America, he repeatedly refers to pearls. On the third voyage in 1498, after passing the mouth of the Orinoco River, he entered the Gulf of Paria, where the natives came to the ship in their canoes in countless numbers, many of them wearing pieces of gold on their breast and some with bracelets of pearls on their arms. Seeing this, I was much delighted and made many inquiries with the view of learning where they found them. They replied that they were to be procured in their own neighborhood and also at a spot to the northward of that place. Continuing the book, it says, This expedition of Pedro Alonso Nino was the first financially profitable voyage to America. And I think we got him in our Columbus and his Negro friends videos. He was actually uh, a dark-skinned European. This is a so-called Negro European. This is Pedro Alonso Nino. All right, so it says that he was the first financially profitable voyage to America. After his return, the, the Cubagua pearl fishery in Venezuela became the object of numerous speculations, and many other Spaniards fitted out voyages, most of them sailing from Hispaniola or Haiti, 900 miles distant. Owing to the ill treatment of the Indians and excessive cruelties towards them, much difficulty was experienced in securing divers. This was relieved in 1508, I listened to this, by transporting large numbers of Indians from Lucayan or Bahama Islands and impressing them into the service. So how did they get their pearl divers? They got them from Lu the Lucayan or the Bahama Islands, all right? So where does it say these were Africans? All right, so you see where they, if there was any so-called Negro or anybody being worked there as, um, you know, divers, it was either the local American Indians that were there doing it for hundreds and thousands of years, or because of what, how they were treating them, they didn't want to be enslaved or do any more favors for the, uh, or trade, you know, with the Spanish or Portuguese. They had to go get other Indians from the Lucayan and Bahama Island, not Africans, other Indians. All right, so this so-called Negro and American Indian that they went and got from Venezuela that were expert pearl divers, all right, and they brought back to Bermuda, all right, how can we prove that's an African when there's more correlation to show that these are most likely with logic, all right, you can see that these are more likely American Indians, all right, continuing to says, these were so expert, we're talking about the Lucayan or Bahama Island people or Indians. These were so expert in the work, we're talking about pearl diving, that individuals sold for upward of 150 ducats each because they were so valuable at pearl diving. With their aid, the fishery prospered so greatly that in 1515, a settlement called New Cadiz was established on Cubagua Island by the governor of Hispaniola, Diego Columbus, son of the discoverer. You hear this? His son got in the pearl business. All right, Columbus. This small island was dry and desolate, without water or wood, which were brought from the mainland, 20 miles distant from Margarita Island, about three miles to the northward. The cupidity of the proprietors of the fishery led to the most cruel treatment of the divers, and if the accounts of the time are to be relied upon, a large percentage of them died under the harsh regiment. About 1515, the unfortunate natives obtained an earnest and influential advocate in Bartolomo de las Casas, who in 1516 prevailed upon the youthful Charles V to decree that the fishery should be prosecuted only in summer, that the divers should not be required to work more than four hours a day, where the deaths exceeded six phantoms, that they should receive good nourishment and have a quart of wine daily, should have hammocks or beds in which to sleep, and should be provided with clothes to put on as soon as they left the water. And by later ordinances, it was stipulated that death should be inflicted on anyone forcing a free Indian to dive for pearls. All right? It was Indians, not Africans. In 1528, the resources of Coche Island were exploited with so much success that within six months, 1,500 marks, 1,200 ounces of pearls was, were secured. Pearl banks were successfully found at Porlamar, Maracapana, Curiano, and at various places on the coast from the Gulf of Paria to the Gulf of Coro, a distance of over 500 miles, which became designated the Pearl Coast. All right. For a number of years previous to 1530, the output exceeded in value of 800,000 
papayas trees annually, approximating one half of the produce of the American mines at that time. And who was working these mines? Who was diving for all this? This was American Indians. It was largely these perils that enriched the cargoes of many of those famous caravels that crossed the Atlantic to Spain. Indeed, for several decades, America was best known in continental Europe as the land where the pearls came. So you think it was coincidence that they went from Bermuda to Venezuela to look for expert pearl divers? These were Indians that were working uh, these places for hundreds of years already. It says, look, ruined and lost, it says here, Spanish destruction of the Pearl Coast in the early 16th century. All right, this is from Mikal Perry, assistant professor of history in Texas AM University. All right, it says in the early 16th century, the area that today comprises eastern Venezuela and its offshore islands in rich Spain with pearls supplied Spanish colonists with Indian slaves. Indian, not Africans, and generated high hopes of finding interior civilizations rich in gold. Gold, coast, pearl, coast. This is all they hear, all of that. Guiana, Guinea, don't play those word games with me. All That's right, so uh, real quick before uh, we continue uh, with the video, just before we leave off uh, this town, right? It was called Margarita, where they were uh, diving for the pearls. The indigenous people, it was actually a local uh place for you know hundreds and thousands of years possibly where indians were you know uh, or indigenous people were diving for pearls all right pearl right let's see what wikipedia says about that all right so when you uh scroll down you know on wikipedia you find this part it says when spanish conquistadors arrived all right we're talking about crypto mostly crypto jews and crypto muslims all right arrived in the western hemisphere they discovered that around the islands of Cubagua and Margarita, some 200 kilometers north of the Venezuelan coast, was an extensive pearl bed, or an extensive pearl bed, a bed of pearl oysters. One discovered and named Pearl La Peregrina was offered to Philip II of Spain, who intended to give it as a gift for his daughter on the occasion of her marriage, but the king found it so beautiful that he kept it for himself. Later, he elevated it to be part of the Spanish crown jewel. And from then on, the pearl is recorded in every royal inventory for more than 200 years, according to Garcilaso de la Vega, who says that he saw La Peregrina at Seville in 1607. Now, we're going to dodge the hijack. It says this was found at Panama in 1560 by a slave worker who was rewarded with his liberty. Now, remember, these were Indians. All right. These were Indians, so they got no source to verify if he was actually free or a slave or he was just an indentured servant, all right? So-called Indians, sorry, that do uh, this work. Now, it says here, margarita pearls are extremely difficult to find today and are known for their unique yellowish color, all right? Unique, nowhere else in the world, unique. Before the beginning of the 20th century, pearl hunting was the most common way of harvesting pearls. Divers manually pulled oysters from ocean floors and river bottoms and checked them individually for pearls. All right, so real quick, the etymology, just before we go, I want to see, uh, look at this correlation. It says the English word pearl comes from the French perle, originally from Latin perna, meaning leg or pierna, how we say in Spanish, leg, after the ham or mutton leg shape bivalve. The scientific name for the family of pearl bearing oysters, Margaritiferidae. All right, Margariti, Margarit comes from the old Persian word for pearl, Margarita. This is an actual Persian word, Margarita, the place that they were, Indians were living for thousands of years diving for pearls. It's called Margarita, which happens to be the word pearl in old persian and the original persian which is the source of the english name margaret margaret margarita all right so now remember margarita island is where the, they went and got the so-called <laughs> slaves which were turned out to be american indians indigenous people who were the expert divers margarita island margarita island all right and i just want to show you where exactly it is in venezuela it's right here on the tip on this island right here this is where they were grabbing their so-called slaves 
Right. All right. So now we uh, come back to this book that I showed uh, in my video from yesterday, uh, Pictorial History of America, embracing both the northern and southern portions. Again, remember this book, I was showing it because of the images that were inside, how they depict the American Indians, as you can see here uh, in the front cover of this book. All right. Copper Colored Tribes of America. This is by uh, S.G. Goodrich again in 1844. And this, and this is the Temple of Ptolemeco. The Temple of Ptolemeco. Take a look at this. All right, check it out. Look at the entrance with all these statues. All right. And look at the uh, so-called Indians, right? Or the so-called Negroes, right? Look at these aboriginals greeting the Europeans. All right. So again, this is uh, the Temple of Ptolemeco. I want to go ahead and just read something on, from another book regarding this temple of Ptolemeco so you can know about it. So we're in this book, The History of Hernando de Soto and Florida, or Record of the Events of the 60 Years from 1512 to 1568, all right? So remember, Florida was vast and big, reached, uh, covered a lot of states back in those times. They considered Florida most of the Southeast. All right, now remember, we're going to talk about this temple right here, right? They're drawn in this other book, Pictorial History of the United States, all right? The Temple of Ptolemeco. All right, you see these statues? All right, so it says here on page 362 of the Hernando de Soto book, it says, Both sides of the road from the camp to this town were covered with trees, of which a part bore fruit, and it seemed as though they promenaded through an or orchard. All right, so there were so many fruits as they were walking in the forest on the way to Ptolemeco. Talomeco is a beautiful town, and quite noted, as it was the residence of the caciques, all right? the residence of the chiefs, or katsin. Katsin in Hebrew means chief, katsin, katsike. So it's a description of the temple of Talomeco. Right? Upon the roof of this temple are many shells of different sizes, of diverse fishes ranged in very good order, but they could not comprehend whence they could have brought them. These people being so far from the sea, unless they had taken them in the rivers and streams which water the province. All these shells are placed with the insides out to give more brilliancy, putting always the great spiral seashell between two small shells, with the interval from one piece to the other filled with many strings of pearls of diverse sizes in the form of festons from the shell to the other. These festons of pearls, which extend from the top of the roof to the bottom, joined to the vivid brightness of the mother of pearl and the shells produce a very beautiful effect when the sun shines upon them the temple had doors proportioned to its grandeur there were seen at the entrance 12 statues of giants all right that's the image we just saw made of wood they are represented with an aspect of so ferocious and menacing that the spanish stopped a long time to consider these figures worthy of admiration of ancient rome 12 Hmm, 12 tribes they say that these giants were placed there to defend the entrance of the door for they are in a row on each side and gradually diminish in size the first are eight feet high and the others proportionally a little less in the order of the tubes of an organ the height of the walls of the temple within is adorned confor conformable to the exterior of the roof for there is a kind of cornice made of the great spiral seashell placed in very good order and between these are seen festins of pearls which hang from the roof. In the intervals of the shells and pearls, there are seen in the arches of a quantity of plumes of diverse colors, feathers tied to the roof, feathers on the roof with pearls, and very well arranged. Besides this order which reigns above the cornice, many plumes and strings of pearls hang from all other parts of the roof, many pearls and feathers. I hang from the roof, retained by imperceptible threads tied above and below, so that it seems as though these works might be ready to fall. I mean, it continues on and on, but I just want to read this part, it's, and you can just pause it and read this part up here. They're talking about some chests that they find in the middle of the temple, and it said, all these chests are filled with pearls in such a manner that the largest contain the largest pearls, and thus, in succession to the smallest, which are full of seed pearls only. Besides, the quantity of pearls was such that the Spaniards avowed that even if there had been more than 900 men and 300 horses, they altogether could not have carried off at one time all the pearls of this temple 
We ought not, however, to be too much astonished at this, if we consider that the Indians of the province conveyed into these chests during many ages all the pearls which they found without retaining a single one of them. And hence we can judge by comparison that if all the gold and silver which they have brought from Peru to Spain had not been transported elsewhere, the Spaniards would now, now be able to cover with gold and silver many churches. So it says, such is the description of the temple and magazine of Talomeco, which the Spaniards who had been in Peru and in other parts of America admired as the wonder of the new world, as the wonder of the new world in North America. Afterwards, they asked the Indians what had led them to amass so much wealth, and they replied that all the chiefs of the country, and principally those of their province, made their grandeur to consist in the magnificence of their temples. All right, so sacred and holy temples, right? Our people contented themselves with this reply, and immediately the controllers of the emperor, who attended the army to receive the fifth of all the wealth it should find, deliberated upon taking the claims of their master. But Soto told them that they ought not to burden themselves with anything, that they were sufficiently encumbered with the arms and provisions which they carried, that after the conquest of Florida, they were divided, and that he to whom should fall the province of Kofasiki should pay the fifth of the treasure which should be found in the temple of Talomeco. Everybody approved this sentiment and they retraced, retraced their route to the quarters. Alright, so I just wanted to go ahead and let you know about the temple of Talomeco, alright? Alright, because, alright, so you can take a look again, let me just back up again. Alright, temple of Talomeco. You see the statues? Twelve, alright? You see what the Indians look like? All right, Temple of Ptolemy. Temple of Ptolemyco, all right? So this is another version of this book, uh, another edition, as you can see. Uh, Pictorial History of America, embracing both the northern and southern portions of the New World uh, from 1848, all right? And uh, we're just going to read a little bit here on Ptolemyco. This is in uh, chapter 34 of this book. So it's here, the disappointment of the Spaniards in their search for gold. Temples of pearls, temples of pearls, all right? And it's a lot of other things, that's Covering Mobile. You know, this is a great book. We're going to get into all these books in future videos, like specific stories, right? We're going to get into specific stories here. And again, this is the uh, Temple of Ptolemaico drawing that we've seen, you know, the 12 statues. As you can see copper colored Indians, all right? Meantime, anxious inquiries were made about the productions of this country. You know, they wanted gold. They were like, oh, man, they're not making the money. The princes answered that they were abundant and specimens were quickly produced. This is the princess of the local uh, people, right? The indigenous people. That instance dispelled all the brilliant dreams under the influence of which the Spaniards had undertaken this long and hazardous expedition. They were looking for gold. The yellow metal proved to be brass or copper. The white metal was nothing but a stone like quartz, which crumbled in the hand. Under this mortifying disappointment, their only consolation was found in pearls, which were found here in abundance. All right, in abundance, pearls in abundance. Now remember, they're in Florida. They're not They're not in uh, Margarita in South America. Now we're in a different part of America, and there's another place in America, so-called Florida, right? The South, somewhere in the Southeast US, where pearls are very abundant. Though they could not form any judgment as to their value. The princess told them they might take as many as they pleased out of a large temple. I'm like, hey, you want pearls? We got so much of that. Just take whatever you want. There's, we have a whole temple full of pearls, which seemed also to be the cemetery of her ancestors and which was lavishly adorned with them. All right. The cemeteries, everything had pearls. Everything had pearls. This fact, which is positively asserted in the Spanish narratives, all right, remember Hernando de Soto, we just read, cannot but appear very singular when contrasted with the reverence for ancestry, which usually distinguishes nations in this stage of society. This and another temple were found in reality to contain pearls sufficient to have loaded the whole army. There were so many pearls, they could have made everybody in the army. Like, there was, remember, there was like 600 of them, right? The Soto had 600 soldiers. It could have been so many pearls for uh, enough for all of them. But they, remember, they couldn't carry the weight. We just read that. They couldn't even carry the weight. They left it. So an abundance which of itself afforded a pretty strong presumption that they were of a small value. The other temple was that of Tolomeco, 
all right? Tolomeco, the most spacious edifice in Florida. The biggest and most spacious edifice in Florida? It was a hundred paces long by 40 broad, the roof formed by six mats placed over each other and brilliantly adorned with shells and pearls. The gate was ornamented with 12 statues of giants in full armor, and all round the interior of the walls were ranged statues of men and women of ordinary size. There were statues everywhere, the men completely armed, armed. Right? Doesn't that sound like those Roman t temples the in or even Egyptian temples? The intendants of the Spanish monarchs were proceeding to levy his faith upon the pearls and other precious articles found in the temple, a measure which was stopped by Soto on the pretense that they could not encumber themselves with just a burden, but doubtless from a well-grounded fear of provoking the hostility of the natives. You see, he's like, yo, we can't really carry that stuff, guys. But he really was just scared. He's like, you know what? I don't think they're going to like we take all their pearls. All right. So real quick, wanted to come to this book now. I know a lot of you know this book right here. Right? You guys seen this cover right here? You see the uh, American indigenous woman being carried here. See the American Indians. Yeah, this is the famous book that a lot of people credit, you know, uh, John Ogilby, which he did do. But he actually translated it from the original Dutch or German, which was written by Arnoldus Montanus. All right. And I want to show you guys, you know, in reality, this is the name of it. The New Way on, on Benkind World of Bekrintrint van America. That's actually, you know, the original look, 1671. And it was in a different language and everything. So John Ogilby just basically translated it. And uh, so we assume, but this is some of the images again. Uh, in this book uh, right here as you can see a lot of the crazy things going on here uh, you know copper colored as always just like we saw in my video my previous video you know how they depict the American indigenous people always of a dark complexion all right so this is in another part of the book you know we got a lot of crazy drawings in here um, you know so this is what appears to be a giant honestly a giant people like hey 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 you know and, um, you know, we just talked about 12 giant statues, right, in front of the Temple of Ptolemeco. All right. So real quick, I just wanted to go ahead and show you, you know, about this book. Uh, go ahead and Google it. Um, America being the latest and most accurate description of the new world. Uh, you'll see the images. Or so just put John Ogilby uh, drawings uh, on Google. You'll see a lot of the different images uh, for yourself. So I'm on page uh, 216 of this book, chapter 3, it says here. And I'm going to see if we can try to figure out what this temple of Tolomeco is. You guys might know better uh, hearing, you know, how they describe the place and the words they use in here. You might know it sounds familiar to you and you might be able to picture where it was. So let's read it. What it says here in this book from the 1600s it says here after this miserable adventure, the business of Florida lay dead for 11 years till Ferdinando Soto's chosen governor of Cuba obtained so much of the emperor's uh, Charles V again who is charles v charles v remember charles v is so-called black man charles v all right holy roman emperor so it says that he received so much he was like his chosen guy right this guy uh ferdinand sotus charles v chose him that he ventured one expedition more for florida besides steaming he carried 500 foot and 350 50 horse which were so 500 on foot, 500 men and, and 50 horses, which landed in the Bay del Espiritu Santo. He marched against the cacique Vitacucho. All right. So he warred against one of the uh, chiefs, Vitacucho, whom he took prisoner with a thousand of the natives. Thousand of them. You see who they were enslaving the Spanish it wasn't Africans. There's a real history here whom he either put to the sword or caused them to be torn in pieces by dogs. You see the cruelty and staying all the winter in Apalachi, all right? Apalachi fortified that place and furnished himself with provisions. He was informed that 13 days journey from thence lay the kingdom of Kofachiki or Kosachiki or Kusa Chiki, right? Kusa or Kofa. Kofachiki, abounding with gold, silver, and pearls. Abounding with what? Gold, silver, and pearls. So much wealth in America, right? Where do you think natural resources really come out of more? We got a future video I'm going to do on gold. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to show you how gold was so abundant here in the Americas. 
and why the Spanish wanted so much of it, right? Which made every one of the Spaniards very the serious to go thither or go there. They heard about the gold, silver, and pearls. They're like, oh, where we can't wait to X marks the spot, right? Treasure, right? Notwithstanding, the way was very dangerous for the valid, validant Floridans lying in the ambush gate in the cornfields, all right? They was, you gotta be careful because the Floridans were in the cut in their little cornfields, right? In the cornfields, my East corn, who had corn first? The start of agriculture was because of corn. Check out my corn videos, four parts. Wounded and killed many of them by shooting from thence. All right. So the Indians were kind of killing some of them. So to so soon as March approached, set forward on his way. In the poor province of Akalaki, or Achalaki, he found a few young people, and the old most of them blind. From Kosa Chiki or Kofa Chiki. Kusa Chiki, he was followed by 4,000 natives who carried the Spaniard luggage, 4,000, and served them as guides through woods and wilderness. There was 4,000 of them helping these cryptos. Remember, these are so-called black people too. These Spaniards, these are cryptos, most of them, crypto Jews or crypto Muslims, all right? The seventh day, they stopped at Great River. With their Sotos sent four companies to seek out a passage over the great river huh i wonder if that's the mississippi after seven days right they walked for seven days so they went far wherever they landed and they went far seven days and they got to the great river remember that great river mississippi means great river in the ojibwe ojibwe chippewa language great river also the nile right nile is a greek word which also means great river so which was the great the real great river Whither Soto sent four companies to seek out a passage over, whereof the three returned without any effect, but the fourth, commanded by Captain Anasio and a colonel of a thousand called Kusa Chikians, Kusa or Kufa Chikians, came to a village, all right, a thousand of them, right? They're aiding, see, they, a lot of them got allies, right? Different tribes allying with these different Spaniards, all right? Came to a village built along the river in which they made a miserable route killing all they lighted on and hanging the skulls of the dead by their sides. You see this, what's going on? This done, they marched back. Sotos, at last, espying a village on the other side of the river, beckoned to the natives to come over to him, whereupon six came immediately, who, understanding that he desired their friendly assistance and trade, promised to acquaint their governess being a young maiden, who soon after came over to Sotos, and presented him with a string of pearls. What? They gave him what? A string of pearls, right? What we learn about today, pearls, right? The abundance of pearls. Who's giving them this? An Indian. They're the experts. They're the pearl divers. He cons he complained to her for provisions, which she promised and part of store him with. All right, so they were talking about the princess. They were expecting gold and everything, and she brought him pearls. Crossing the river, he found a brave country where were pearls as big as gray piece copper or golden color but no gold they were pearls so big so many pearls here right out of the tombs of their princess the spanish officers with the leaf of the aforementioned made their governess got an incredible treasure in pearls they were just taking the tombs right robbing the tombs these these cryptos uh, Spaniard Jews and Muslims, uh, Spaniards, these Moorish, Morisco, Morano people, these were the uh, original Spaniards that came. Yeah, they were taking all the tomb, the treasures in the tombs, all the pearls. Remember the chest full of pearls. In the village Tolomeco, they did the like, just like in Tolomeco. Remember Tolomeco, but here their provisions grow on scarce. The army was divided into two bodies Baltasar de Gallegos, all right, Baltasar. The Gallegos leading one and Sotos the other, yet the sign of them both was on the province of Chalaque. With their marching, they were surprised by such a violent storm that few would have left to relate their adventures had not the trees bore it off from them. For it not only thundered and lightened, and if heaven and earth would have met, but also hailstones fell down as big as eggs. You hear that? Hailstones falling on the Spanish when they were in America, thunder and lightning. Like heaven and hell was falling on them. All right, they're describing this. 
which beat down the boughs of trees in the pleasant valley of Shualu or Gualu or Walu, right? Gualu, Shualu, belonging to the kingdom of Kusa Chiki. They reflected 15 days and then marched through countries of Gua Stali or Guali or Guahali or Acostis, Acostis and Kusa, where above a thousand Indians adorned with plumes of feathers and rich fur cloaks. All right, plumes and feathers and rich fur cloaks, fur, you were furred out, came to meet and welcomed them and to desire them from the cacique to stay for all the winter. But Soto's resolving to go to the haven, uh, Chusi refused the same. All right, so again, that's it. It's a lot of good drop in these books, like the stories, if you just picture them. All right, so I just want to show you where Margarita Island is again, you know. We're gonna get a little reference. We're gonna try to do a little full circle here. So Isla Margarita, remember Margarita means pearl in old Persian. Is this the original Margarita? Who named it, right? How did they know? You know, Margarita and there's so much pearls there. You saw how much wealth. This is just one video. I read uh, a lot of times how much pearls they got out of the Spanish and how much uh, riches they made because of that. Now I want to show you, you know, from here, they say they were going to uh, Bermuda, right? Bermuda is right here. You know, United States is over here and Bermuda is right here in the middle of the ocean. This is Bermuda. So they were coming straight from over there, Margarita Island. Again, those were American Indians. They do admit one Carib Indian, right? And then they say a black man, but we already know it was American Indians in both uh, ways. They have no proof of it being any African. That is all conjecture. Now, real quick, all right, remember the Bahamas, all right? Talked about the Lucayans being uh, actually the ones who were being enslaved and sent to Margarita. Remember, told us in the, that book, The History of the Pearl, that they were bringing Lucayans to die. The Lucayans from the Bahamas, the Lucayans from the Bahamas, all right? What did we learn yesterday, my new video from yesterday about the Lucayans? Well, first of all, yesterday in the video that I uploaded yesterday, if you haven't seen it, check it out after this presentation, talking about the Aboriginal people of the Bahamas, right? The Lucayans. What, what did we learn? That they're dark skinned race, a very dark skinned race, very friendly, hospitable, good people that were taken advantage of, all right? They are dark of complexion, all right? This is what Columbus describing them. All of them go as naked as they came into the world. You know, that's his opinion. You know, the hair is coarse, he's saying they are dark complexion. They are dark complexion. Again, dark skin race, the Lucayans. So wouldn't these people be uh, confused with so-called uh, Africans or be called so-called black, right? A black man, a black man. What is black? Black is a crayon color. Now, what else did we learn about the Lucayans in yesterday's video? Again, this is from yesterday's video. Again, it's called Pre-Columbus Black Nations of America, Primary Sources and Historical Images, and they're not from Africa. All right, but right here was signed very important, and I'm going to do a whole big video about this eventually and just, just break it down, prove it, not just with the Lucayans, but with many different uh, nations that were put under this and uh, eventually classified in history as so-called Blacks or so-called African slaves. But in reality, we know these are people of dark complexion, the Lucayans from Bahama, who are living in an Eden-like simplicity and happiness in their island. See? Now, what does this say? It says, 20 years later, when Spaniards had exterminated nearly all the natives of Hispaniola, they stole away the Lucayans to the number of 40,000. 40,000 to slave to slave in the mines and on the plantations of Hispaniola. So now, first of all, they were telling us that when they ran out of so-called local labor or indigenous slaves, they were going to Africa to get more uh, to replenish them. Right. But look what they really came. They came for the Lucayans and, and then, you know, not just the Lucayans, but these are one of the people they came for. Look at this. 40,000. All right, so a lot of these, it says uh, after 50 years, they became extinct. No, you, you're not extinct. You're still here. A lot of them didn't just end up in Hispaniola. We know now a lot of them based on the book we just read. Let's just go back to it real quick, right? Again, the book of the pearl we just read, right? What did it tell us? Who was they bringing uh, to Margarita? Margarita means pearl in old Persian. That is the America is the true old world. You see the full circle. Now, let me show you another full circle again. All right, so again, remember what it told us. And remember where the Lucayans were taken, supposedly, right? 40,000 of them were taken to Hispaniola. 
Now, where were these so-called Spanish coming from to supplying, to supplying the divers? Now look, pay attention. After his return, the Cubagua pearl fishery became the object of numerous speculations and many other Spaniards fitted out voyages from most of them sailing from Hispaniola or Haiti, all right? 900 miles distant owing to the ill treatment of the indians and excessive cruelties towards them much difficulty was experienced in securing divers so they were having trouble getting the local uh, uh population indigenous population to keep diving for them so what did they do this was relieved in 1508 by transporting large number of indians from the Lucayan or Bahama Islands, large numbers of them. Remember, they had almost 40,000 of them they enslaved. And look who was really coming. And they were coming from Hispaniola, a lot of them. Because remember, they were trying to send them to Hispaniola when they didn't need more over there. What, where else would they were sending them? To Margarita here, Cubagua Island, Margarita here, to die for pearls, right? Margarita and Venezuela. And this is where they supposedly got the same so-called a uh, black man and a Carib Indian to go to Bermuda eventually. It's a full circle. You guys see the hijack. I hope you guys understand this is big. With their aid, the fishery prospered so greatly that in 1515, a settlement called New Cadiz was established on Cubagua Island by the governor of Hispaniola, Diego Columbus, son of the discoverer, right? New Cadiz, Cadiz, a Moorish town, isn't it? So again, let me guys, let me show you the journey. So the Lucayans, right? The Lucayans came from here, Bahamas, right? They went, they were sent all the way down here to Venezuela's Margarita Island. All right. From there, some of them ev eventually ended up in the Bermudas, in the Bermudas Islands. You see, full circle. And it was never any uh ha anything to do with so-called africans or any other people being enslaved this was local population a lot of the times again i've done many many videos about american indian slavery make sure to go back on that whole series from indigenous american to african american so you guys can get the information again we've proven who the spanish who the portuguese the dutch so-called english all these so-called tags you know who they were really uh, using for their labor, for their indentures, for their encomiendas and so-called slavery. Uh, and, I, and the other source, again, was coming not from Africa, but from Europe, from Europe. Their indentured servants, their unwanted, all the Sephardic Jews and Moors they were getting rid of, Huguenots, Protestants, you know, undesirable, the Black Irish, all this stuff, the Jacobite prisoners, everything we've learned, all right? We got to start really getting over uh, our beliefs and just start going with the truth and the history, all right? All right, so when we're talking about the Pearl Coast or the Gold Coast, future video, we're gonna see where was the real Gold Coast, the real Guiana, Guiniana, Guiniana, Guiana, the real Gold Coast, a play of words here going on, but there's a true history here to uncover. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, I'm going to go ahead and finish it right here. Thank you for uh, tuning in. Make sure to subscribe and like, share the video so we can get the word out. You know, I hope you guys enjoyed this. It's very deep what we learned today. Remember, when they're talking about so-called slaves or a black, the first blacks, crayon colors, you got to really question them. Who are they really talking about? Because we found out today that they were always talking about, in this case, the Lucayans who were being sent to Haiti and South America to slave and dive and then eventually to Bermuda. And in history, they told us that these people were so-called African, erasing a whole people.